Thank you. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here. I have spoken here once before. Thank you so much, Dana, to be in this space, a national cathedral. The very concept of a national cathedral is very moving. The idea that there is a space that is our collective national sacred space. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is what that means. Um, I'm supposed to go a little bit back here because I'm told that that's necessary for you guys. <clears throat> we all know the Chinese proverb, or most of us have heard it, that when women awaken, mountains move. And so I want to talk to you tonight about what it means for a woman to awaken and also what it means for a mountain to move. When we talk about the idea of a collective sacred space, the sacred space, as gorgeous as it is in architectural terms and in actual material form, is actually but a symbol of what real sacred space is. Sacred space isn't out there. Sacred space is in here. And a founding principle of our country is e pluribus unum, out of many, one. So in the material world, we are many. In the spiritual realm, we are one. In the material world, we witness and bear witness to the world according to our body senses. And in the spiritual realm, there's a different kind of knowing and a different kind of seeing. I read an interview many years ago with Yoko Ono, where she said that the feminization process is a spiritualization process. The idea that the masculine, and there is a divine masculine and a divine feminine, yin and yang, the idea of the world of the earth is the yin, it's the feminine, and the realm of spirit, the realm of sky, the realm of the masculine. This yin and yang, we need both. But we have developed as a civilization as we know and for a very, very long time in a way that the major holders of feminine values, namely the women of the human race, were not allowed, even in Western civilization, some of the power of our own stories and the power of our own visions, the power of our own values, the power of our own feelings. And it has hurt the world greatly that we have been silenced and what has happened in countries like ours over the last several hundred years is not only did we emerge in ways that ultimately gave us the powers to speak, but what has happened in the last several decades is we had to deal with the fact that even when we were given legal permission that we didn't have before, even though we were given certain kinds of societal permission to speak our own truths before, the biggest work for many of us has been to give ourselves emotional permission. And that is where many of us are. <clears throat> it's not enough at a certain point for your society to say, you're a woman and you can dress however you want, you can do whatever you want and say whatever you want. If you yourself, based on your own childhood, based on your own experience, feel that you yourself won't give yourself permission. Sometimes we won't give ourselves permission because we feel that other people will laugh at us. Other people will make fun of us. I was reading in one study that for a woman to feel sure of herself enough to speak her mind, to speak her opinion, she has to feel 80% sure of her facts. But for a man to feel sure enough to express his opinion, he has to feel 20% confident of his facts. So sometimes the point is not that we don't have legal permission, but that we have not given ourselves emotional permission. And it is extremely important that we give ourselves emotional permission to share our views and our values today, because we are at a point where the absence of the feminine values in how we order human civilization is a threat to the survival of our species. The fact that we are not speaking. <clears throat> One day, years ago, I was doing a goddess ceremony, and it was a solstice, and we were all dancing, and I was wearing the requisite cut velvet. I don't know where we got the cut velvet with the goddess, but for whatever reason. And it was like a brick to my forehead when I realized that the goddess wanted more from me than chanting. 
and the goddess wanted more from me than dancing, and the goddess wanted more from me than crystals, and the goddess wanted more from me than mauve. <laughs> when I was growing up, my mother was a very traditional housewife, and my mother acted and lived her life in such a way that the most important things to her were her children and her home, and taking care of my father and the rest of my family. And I grew up at a time when it seemed like my mother's life was not important enough. And I wanted to go out there and do something important. Of course, once you become metaphysically astute enough, you know that there is no out there. Space and time themselves are all part of the illusion. But it was more than that. It took me decades to realize how right my mother was. My mother was absolutely right that it is a woman's job to take care of the children. My mother was absolutely right that it's a woman's job to take care of the home. It's just that we have evolved and must evolve to the realization that that means that every one of the children on this earth is our children and the earth itself is our home. <clears throat> We've taken so long just getting to the point where we could speak. Now we need to think about what we're saying now that we can speak. It's not enough that women are in the pulpit. It's not enough that women are in the boardroom. It's not enough that women are in politics if all we do is mimic the same patriarchal nonsense that kept us down before we got here. <clears throat> One of the reasons we've been afraid to speak our truth is because we've been afraid that not everyone would approve of us if we did. We've been afraid that not everyone would think we were nice if we did. We were afraid that if we really speak our truth, would not everybody would say nice things about us. Not everybody would think we were attractive. Well, guess what? They won't get over it. If you, everything that you're saying and doing in your life as a woman, is getting applause all the time, you might want to think again about exactly what you're saying. Because in order for us to truly stand for feminine values today, we are by definition challenging the status quo. The status quo in a country like ours, the richest country in the world, in which our government here, the seat of our government here in this great democracy, here in the United States of America, has become a system of legalized bribery, acting more as a handmaiden in service to corporate profits than to the people and the planet on which we live. <clears throat> We as women in a country where millions of American children actually are hungry, are hungry. The very fact that in parts of the world, thousands of children starve every day. But in this country, children are hungry. Millions of American children go to schools that do not have functioning toilets. We have millions of American children who go to schools where they do not have the minimum school supplies necessary to adequately teach a child to read. And if an American child, or I assume any child, but in this country, if a child does not know how to read by the time they're eight, the chances of their graduating from high school are drastically diminished. Their chances of incarceration are drastically increased. Where are the women of America? Because if the women of America were awake, ladies and gentlemen, we can't, you know, let's talk about people being woke. If you're okay with everything that is, you're not so woke. At this point, to be awake also means the courage to stand on what we believe. The other day I was listening to the fact that the United States and the Secretary of State was talking about the fact that even though there's a country where our intelligence agencies are pretty clear he murdered a journalist who was a permanent resident of the United States. The Secretary of State was saying, well, you know, you can still stand for your values and have strategic partnerships with people who do not share those values. Strategic partnerships with people who do not share your values. We have to have strategic partnerships with our ancestors. We have to have strategic partnerships with our great-great-grandchildren. We have strategic partnerships with the ages, and we have to have a strategic partnership with God. And in order for us to have a strategic partnership with God, that means American women will not go along. We will make ours a different bottom line. And we will say, this country should not be run like a business. This country should be run like a family. And it is the job of every female when we are deeply aligned with the feminine within us. Can you imagine what this country would be like? And can you imagine what this world would be like if American women said about every single domestic and international policy of the United States, 
what about the babies? How will that affect the children? Because if you got the Clean Water Act, you're hurting our babies. If you got the Clean Air Act, you're hurting our children. If you overturn the ban on pesticides that are known to hurt a developing child's brain, you are hurting our children. So American women, the idea of thinking, you know, if we would just be quiet, we can get a pass. We've lived with that for so long. So many ethnic groups, I understand about that as a Jew. You're taught it as a Jew your whole life, kind of keep your head down a little bit, and then they won't mess with us. This idea, keep your head down and say they, so they won't mess with you, shows no courage. It is time for us to do for all the children of the world what any of us would do for our own children. Do you know in every advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives, there is a common anthropological characteristic <clears throat> and that anthropological characteristic is the fierce behavior of the adult female of that species when she senses a threat to her cubs. You come after her cubs, she's coming after you. That's true of the mama bear, it's true of the mama tiger, it's the true of the mama lion. And do we say about the bear or the tiger or the lion when she fiercely goes after somebody who's coming after her cubs, oh, I think she's strident. Oh, I think she's got anger issues. Hell no. You know, among the hyenas, do you know that the adult female hyenas encircle their babies and will not let the adult hyenas get anywhere near the food until the cubs have been fed? I say surely the women of America could do better than the hyenas. <clears throat> But the hyena is just following her instinct. And that's the point. We are not following ours. It is in every species demonstrated that the female, the adult female, takes care of the cubs. The adult female takes care of the young. And any conscious person takes care of the young. That's what it means to be awake spiritually. What it means to be awake spiritually is to be awake to why we're on this earth. Not just awake to how we might succeed in whatever the world says or our society says success means. That's not necessarily to be awake. Given what it is you're doing with your talents and your abilities, that might mean that you're more co-opted than ever before. It's not liberation to just follow along with what society says is meaningful. It's liberation to ask ourselves, what are we here on this earth to do? And when we ask what we are here on this earth to do and we take that question seriously from any kind of spiritual perspective, that means that we are love and we are here to love. That's what it means to awake. What it means to be awake is to say every day of our lives to the God of our understanding, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? And you know what? That line from A Course in Miracles, one of, the, one of the lines also in that book that I love is where spirit says, I assure you I have time and space under my control. What does that mean? That means that in that quantum realm where love is what it's all about, where we dedicate ourselves to love, not just the easy love, but also the, and not just the convenient love, not just the love for our own children, but the love for all children. Not just the love which when we talk about it, we'll get applause. Not just the love which when we talk about it, we'll get it everybody's approval. But the love that takes a stand. That says, I take a stand for my child, I take a stand for every child, and I take a stand for the earth itself because we're living at a point and will increasingly live at a point in this 21st century where nobody's children will be safe if we do not begin to live in a way where we care for the safety and well-being for every child. What this does is it lifts us. If you look at, at, at um, Christian architecture, if you look at Jewish architecture, if you look at Muslim architecture, if you look at so much religious and spiritual architecture of the world, it's always pointing up, pointing up, pointing up to higher consciousness. When we are in higher consciousness in that sacred space within ourselves, we are literally living within a different domain of consciousness. And when we are living within a different domain of consciousness, there's a line in The Course in Miracles where it says, you are heir to the laws that prevail within the world that you identify with. If you only think of yourself as a body, then you are tied to a perception of the three-dimensional world, and you are heir within your experience to all the limitations thereof. 
But when you say, this is not about my body, my body is just a suit of clothes. I'm a spirit, I'm not a body. When we identify with the spirit rather than the body, that is the journey of enlightenment. And then just as in this sacred space, it's not about the place where we're separate, it's about the place where we are one. In A Course in Miracles it says, you are like sunbeams thinking you are separate from other sunbeams. You are like waves in the ocean thinking you are separate from other waves. But the truth of the matter is there's no place where a wave can separate itself from other waves, and there's no place where a sunbeam can separate itself from other sunbeams. But think about the extraordinary psychological difference in our own self-perception between thinking of ourselves as a separate wave in the ocean versus identifying with the oneness of the ocean itself. If I'm just one, o one wave, how could I not be terrified that I will be obliterated by a wave that is bigger than me? If I think of myself as just one wave, how can I not live in terror of the ocean? But if I think of myself as part of the ocean, how could I not think of myself as powerful? <laughs> yeah, I move, it moves. It moves, I move. And that's what it means to have the power that moves mountains. Because when you identify with your spirit rather than your body, then you know that there is a power in you but not of you that can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And then you are here about, as it says in the Christian tradition, you're here about your father's business. And you don't even worry about how you're going to do anything. You don't worry about strategizing. You don't need to worry about what sounds reasonable. Another line in The Course in Miracles where it says, love restores reason and not the other way around. This world in which it's all so secular, so corporatized, so overly rationalistic, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable that our planet is on the brink of destruction if we don't take care of this environmental crisis? Is it reasonable that the United States alone has thousands of nuclear bombs? Is it reasonable that we're just allowing for the erosion of our democracy? Is it reasonable that we are allowing market forces to take precedence over the health and well-being of our children and people on this planet and the earth itself? There's nothing reasonable about that. Love takes us to a higher reason. Love restores reason. The probability vectors of the planet at this time are such that people generations from now would look back at us and go, what were they not thinking? Did they have no logic? And I believe that it is women who now need to say exactly that. And I know that the Dalai Lama said that if the world is to be saved, it will be because of the Western woman. And I admire the Dalai Lama as much as anybody does. I honor the Dalai Lama as much as anybody does, but we don't need any man's verification. <clears throat> We're gonna do it because it's coming up from the bottom of things. We're gonna do it because we know better. You know, when I turned 50 years old, somebody said 50 is the age past which you don't care what other people think anymore. Just like they tell you when you turn 30, 30 is the age past which she's young isn't an excuse anymore. Well, let me tell you something. 50, it's true, really is an age after which you don't care what they think anymore. Let me tell you about 60. 60 is not just an age where you don't care what they think, you have to say it. You have to say it. They say you get more conservative as you get older, and in some ways, socially, I think that might be true, but politically, no. If you're not gonna just be radical at this point, because love is radical. To say love should be the bottom line rather than money, oh, that's radical. To say taking care of children should come before taking care of corporate profits, ooh, that's radical. To say we should be a democracy, rather than an oligarchy or a corporatocracy where basically the major resources of the country are in the hands of just a few people. Is that radical? Yes, it is radical. And that is what a mother is. That is what a woman is. That is what a protector of the earth is. And we are all now called to be the mothers of the new world. Now, younger women have babies. Some, some choose to. Certainly the planet, the species would not continue were it not for the fact that young people choose to have babies. Enough young people have to choose to have babies in order for the human race to continue. That's true of any race, species. But we are now at a point in the development of our species where it won't be enough for our species to continue 
and to thrive. It will take more than young people actually having physical babies. We will not survive if we don't start producing more wisdom. And what happens with the production of wisdom is just as our bodies are sometimes the wombs, wombs for children, the emergence of new babies on the planet, our consciousness is the womb for the emergence of new wisdom and for the emergence of life itself. Many people relate to the archetype of the, of, the, of the Titanic, not just because it was a good movie. We relate to the archetype of the Titanic because the story speaks to something so deep. It speaks to something so deep because when it comes to the Titanic, we can all feel this frightening feeling that we're sort of on the Titanic right now. We're headed for the iceberg right now. That iceberg could take the form of a nuclear disaster, could take the form of a biochemical disaster, it could take the form of an environmental disaster. There are so many ways that the ship of humanity's fate could move in such a way as to crash into that iceberg. But what happened in the, in the actual story of the Titanic? The captain of the ship knew we should not go that far north, we should not gun that engines, and we do not have enough lifeboats. And he tried to tell the owner of the company we should not do this. And the owner of the company shouted him down, and so in his despair he went downstairs and he just went to sleep in his cabin. By the time they awoke him and said, Captain, come up, come up, come up, we're in big trouble, it was too late. You know, in Asian philosophies, they talk about how time does not go in a straight line, it goes in a spiral. And the story of the Titanic is coming back around again. And each and every one of us, each and every one of us is the captain of this ship. This is what it means to be a citizen. This is what it means to be a citizen. We must be as citizens in this country exactly what we are in our own homes, where we're not going to let anybody mess with our kids. Nobody's going to mess with our babies. You're going to mess with, my ba with that baby. You're going to have to mess with me. You know what I imagine? You know what I envision? I envision a world, and it can be. You know, American women aren't any better than American men, and Americans aren't any better than anyone else. Note to someone who lives near here. Now, God, doesn't see, God doesn't see anyone as special than anyone else. The idea of the power of American women does not lie in the fact that we are somehow special but in the fact that we have a profound responsibility, a profound responsibility because we are the women of the most powerful nation on this earth. And with citizenship comes more than rights, also comes responsibilities. We have the responsibility. We are captains of this ship. Everything that is happening in our society today that many of us are so concerned about, how fear has been harnessed for political purposes, all this terrible way that hate and bigotry and racism have been harnessed for political purposes in this country. I see those things as a kind of opportunistic infection. Our immune system was weakened. Our immune system was weakened because we as individuals forgot that that's what an individual citizen is. We are the immune system. If we are not standing for dignity and standing for justice and standing for decency and standing for love and standing for democracy, we need to get over whatever naivete ever led us to believe that people who would, not, who would take advantage of that weakened immune system would not be at the doorstep. We have to take responsibility for what has happened in this country. And when we take responsibility for what has happened in this country, then we do think of ourselves as the immune systems, the immune system that needs to rise up now, just like the captain has to get up out of bed and turn this ship around in time. And we can do that. And from a spiritual perspective, that means that each and every one of us will be guided. Just as every cell in the body is guided, you to the pancreas, you to the lungs, you to the heart. In human society, you to the arts, you to business, you to science, and all of us to politics. When we devote our lives, when we say, I am here to be an instrument of love, this is only, the only reason I'm here. Dear God, use me, my favorite, my favorite gospel song is Send Me then we will know what to do. God's not gonna tell me what you're supposed to do and God's not gonna tell you what I'm supposed to do, but we all will find ourselves living through a natural guidance. Just as in the body, every cell is led through a natural guidance system to be with the organ it's supposed to be with, 
you to the pancreas, you to the lungs, you to the bladder, you to the stomach, or whatever. And then it is led to be part of a collaborative matrix with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which it is part. And every once in a while, for reasons that scientists understand to some extent and don't understand to other extent, cells go insane. And cells disconnect from the collaborative matrix and they go off to do their own thing. And cells say, I don't want to serve the healthy functioning of the lungs. I want to go off and do my own thing. What do we call that? It's cancer. It's malignant. It's malignant in the body and it is malignant in consciousness. And that is what has happened to the human race. We have been infected by a malignant consciousness which says, it's all about me. It is not all about you. And there have even been those, there have even been those who in the name of spiritual wisdom have acted in the last couple of decades as though the highest spiritual mountaintop is that you can manifest your dreams. No, the highest spiritual mountaintop is not that you can make your dreams come true. I'll tell you who made his dreams come true. Adolf Hitler. There is more to being a human being than getting what you want. Because there's more to a human being than thinking, it's just about me. And when we are in a sacred space, that's where that's supposed to drop, that sense of separateness. We're not here just to live for what we think we might want, but rather to be instruments for something bigger and higher than ourselves. And when we do that, we gain a capacity that comes with that. Because as I said, when you begin to identify if you are identifying only with this mortal material plane, then you only have the power of the mortal material plane. But when we identify with the realm beyond this, then we have the power of a realm beyond this. That's where the word charisma comes from. Charisma came from the temple space and the church space. It means of the spirit. It means that you'll have a little more something. Nobody will know exactly where you got that. You're just, you got something because you will be lifted, because you will be carrying a power that is in you, but not of you. That is where we must be now. That is the only way that we will move mountains. The probability vectors on this planet are not good. Environmentally, socially, economically, things are not doing well. And they will not be turned around if we continue to do more of what we have been doing. We will not be able to turn this country around and we will not be able to turn this world around until we challenge some fundamental assumptions. One of those fundamental assumptions is that the only issues that matter are the things that are happening out there. That's why our politics is so limited. Our politics is a very limited skill set because it's a very limited number of colors on the planet. What's happening in this world is a spiritual battle between forces inside us all of darkness and of light. And until we address those internal issues, our country and our world will not be able to transform any more than our own individual lives can. You can't change your life just by changing things on the outside. You can only change your life if you're willing to change things on the inside too. That means that you have to admit your own character defects. That means you have to atone for the places where you have been wrong. That means you must be willing to make amends and you must be willing to change. That is the only way an individual can change. Those are the feminine dimensions, the internal life. And all that a nation is is a collection of individuals. So we won't be able to transform America just like we can't transform our own individual lives without admitting our character defects, without atoning for our mistakes without making amends that need to be made and being willing to change. We must admit our militarism. We must admit our racial injustice. We must admit the fact that we have sold out our government to corporate forces, to the higher bidder rather than to the democratic values and human values that make us correct. We must atone for that racial injustice. <clears throat> We should make amends by paying reparations for slavery. We should atone for genocide. <clears throat> we should atone for genocide of the Native Americans and give back the Black Hills of South Dakota to the Sioux. You know, whether you're an individual or a country, if you're not gonna look at yourself, nothing's gonna really change. You know, I have a career. 
working with people in crisis, and I've lived through enough of my own. And I know what it's like when the arrogance and the elite and those who are making it look at conversations like this in a mocking way, in a minimizing way, put it down, call it silly, call it intellectually lightweight, call it new age, call it whatever they call it. But I'll tell you when they stop laughing, when their own child is a heroin addict. I'll tell you when they stop laughing, when they themselves have been diagnosed with cancer. I'll tell you when they stop laughing is when they themselves have to fall to their knees. And you know what I've seen around people who have fallen to their knees and what I've seen in myself in the times when I've had to fall to mine? A greater nobility, a greater intelligence, a greater humility, a greater love, and a greater level of truth. When I worked very closely with the AIDS crisis back in the 1980s when it first began, it took a while before Western medicine had much to offer. It's not like they weren't trying. But at that time, the doctors would look at people like myself who were running support groups for people with AIDS, and they were very minimizing, very condescending, very paternalistic. Oh, well, it's nice if you make them feel better. But these doctors kept playing card after card after card, coming up empty for quite a while, and we celebrate the fact that they're not now. And we celebrate the fact that they're not mocking like that now either. Your oncologist is likely to be the first person to tell you to get over to one of those spiritual support groups. But the reason I tell you the story is because I was there. I was in those rooms where those people were dying. I was in those rooms watching those doctors and their feelings of complete utter helplessness because they had played every card and could come up with nothing. I was there and I saw the eyes in those people change and I saw the looks on the faces of those people change and I saw those people go from condescension and arrogance to saying to people who were speaking about the inner life, what have you got? And the world is better because they did. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are politically today. And the powerful and the elite, and the elite, maybe they're not yet saying it in front of the cameras and in public, but I think behind closed doors, the people who run this country and the people who run this world are just as concerned and just as scared as the rest of us. And I think that behind closed doors, they're saying to more people who represent issues of the inner life in ways maybe more than we know, what have you got? And my message to the women of America Oh, we got a lot. We got some things to say. We've been waiting for you to listen to us. But now that you are open in a way that perhaps you've never been, let me tell you what we got. First, you feed the children. Next, you take care of the earth. Next, you atone for these horrible ways we have allowed money and market forces and what amounts to public whoredom to take precedence over justice and love and mercy. That's what we've got. What we've got is children who hurt. What we've got are children who are starving on this planet. What we've got is a planet that is in trouble. And what we've got, because you guys are still in control, is a government that is little more than a handmaiden to the forces that make that continue. Milton Friedman from the Chicago School got together with Ayn Rand. They had a baby, this monstrosity called trickle-down economics. We know what it was. We know what it's done. And it's time for the women of America to say, you know what, honey, we don't even want any more for you to just listen to us. Why don't you get out of that chair and let us sit there? At this point, <clears throat> at this point, we got so much pent up conviction. We've got, and it's not about anger. You don't say it's angry when the, babe, when the bear or the lion or the tiger says, you come after my babies, I'm coming after you. Moral outrage is not born of anger, ladies and gentlemen. Moral outrage is born of love. But I'll tell you this much, anytime a woman does say, it will be this way because mama said so. Just like we say it in our homes, we say it in our country and in our world. Yes, there will be people who say, ooh, I don't think she's attractive. Or ooh, she's uppity. Or who, who is she to have her? an opinion and to express her opinion, I'll tell you what's going to make the difference. And I say this particularly to younger women about the age of feminism that I grew up in. 
we understood that when it came to feminism, none of us were gonna get there unless all of us get there. You leave out sisterhood, none of us are getting there. Every single woman needs to know when she saunters out to say the truth that she believes and to stand for love and to stand for children and to stand for democracy and to stand for mercy and to challenge mass incarceration and to stand to challenge injustice and to challenge the forces that would hurt children and hurt the species that every woman could go out there knowing it won't get too bad because if the worst comes to worst, there's going to be a woman on my left and a woman on my right. And she's going to say, you go, sister, that there's going to be a man, that there's going to be a woman. It's time not only for us to be silent about what we believe, but we must stop being silent when other women say what they believe. I saw a, st a study once. I read a study once when it said that if one woman, and this was talking about women and men, but this could be, I think this is genderless. It was saying that if one person speaks up for like higher values, let's say, and says, well, I, I, I think we should think about something other than the economic bottom line. And other people like look at her, let's say, and roll their eyes and say, oh, you've been spending too much time in California. <laughs> this study was saying if even one other person if even one other person will say, I agree with her, then the entire system changes. So it's not enough to speak your truth. When you hear another woman speak her truth, you speak up too. That is what's going to make things change. <clears throat> you know, Dana was talking before about how we've all been broken open. And I, I'm the first to agree that it's sometimes these crises in life, that's why I think America's gonna be better for this. We're gonna get through this period of time. This is changing us. And we're gonna get through this time because we're changing, we are going to be bringers of change, and then we must remain changed. But at the same time, we must not coddle our weaknesses either. If I hear one more woman say, I'm just so traumatized by everything that's happening, just in case it needs to be said, whoever you are, we do not have time for you to get over your trauma work before you show up for your country. <laughs> this drama, let me tell you something, American women are not porcelain dolls. We are not porcelain dolls, we are fierce. The feminine is loving and the, and the feminine is fierce. You think the people who walked across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? They didn't know if they were going to take the dogs out, the hoses out, the bullets out. You think the women suffragettes who were force-fed in prison with those metal contraptions around their, their throats were not traumatized, that they were not stressed, that they were not anxious? Crises are never convenient. This is a crisis upon us. It's a crisis of our democracy and it's a crisis of our world. It's not convenient. Of course we wish it happened later after a little more was together in my life. It doesn't work that way. You rise to the occasion when it happens. If your children need you, if your men need you, if your earth needs you, if your friends need you, if in order to be the wife, or the husband, the friend, the child, the parent, the citizen, the friend, if in order to do that, you have to think a little less about yourself, then think a little less about yourself and rise to the occasion. And when we do, one of the things that happens when you do that is a lot of the things that you thought you needed to work through before you could rise to the occasion, once you've risen to the occasion, they just dropped all around you. Because the only reason they were there was it was distorted energy that was supposed to be used by you the way you were created to use it to live a better life, to be the awakened person to move those mountains. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the 11th hour. I don't need to tell anybody that. We know it's the 11th hour, but it's not midnight yet. Americans are often slow to get there. This is not news. Ask anybody in the world. Americans are often slow to get there, but when we do, we slam it like nobody's business. And it is time for us to show who we are. It is time to show that we are willing to confront our shadows and confront our own errors and our own character defects as others have done in their time. From the abolitionists to the suffragettes to the civil rights workers, they did not whine, they organized. As Martin Luther King said, those of us who love must organize as effectively as do those who wish only to wage war. We need to shift the investments in this country 
massively in the direction of children under eight. We need to shift the investments in this country massively in the direction of waging peace as well as waging war, as well as preparedness for war. We need to massively change some things, fundamentally change some things. And it is women who don't even have to figure out what to say. All we have to do is give each other permission to say it. And when we do, we will do more than move mountains. We will go down in history. We will go down in history as people who in our time did rise to the occasion, who in in our time did make this nation and help this world to self-correct. We were women who loved deep, who prayed hard, and in the final analysis, we kicked ass. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you.